George yawned and fidgeted on the carpet. The light from my bedside lamp caught his blonde hair and it made it shine like a halo. He twirled a lock from his fringe around his index finger, let it snap back into place and started twirling it again. The kid looked bored. He'd obviously agreed to come around mine for a sleepover because I was... I was new at school and he wanted to see what kind of house I lived in. Get a sense of what I was like. But I could tell he was already regretting the decision. Thought you said you had a PS4. George's eyes flicked around the bedroom, as if he was hoping the console would magically appear from somewhere. And we'd been upstairs since dinner. He'd explored my room, we'd chatted for a bit, then watched some random shows on Netflix. Things were going okay at first, but as the last light bled out of the day and the sky outside darkened, I could tell George was losing interest. That was when I suggested we do something a bit different. Nah, I, I don't have one, I said, sorry. Uh, are you still up for having a go at this game, though? What, telling each other stories? Isn't that little kid stuff? George glanced at his watch on his wrist. I followed his gaze. George's watch was the first thing I noticed about him. He sits in front of me in English, and I spotted the watch after a ray of sunshine glinted off its face and caught my eye. It's a really nice watch. Most of the kids in my year have digital watches, those blocky ones that light up when you press a button on the side, but George's watch was different, more adult. It was one of the reasons why I picked George to invite over. Hey, can I try your watch on? George looked at me and frowned. What? Your watch. Can I try it on? It's really nice. George stared at me for a second longer. One hand moved to touch the strap on his wrist as if to make sure that it was still secure. Sorry, I don't let anyone try on my watch. My dad said I'm not allowed. He glanced around the room once more, his eyes going from the door to the dark window. He sighed. Okay, let's play this dumb game then. What do I have to do? Ignoring the bored look on his face, I smiled. This, it's really easy. We just take turns telling each other scary stories. Like, like the scariest story you can possibly think of. Then, whoever's is the scariest, wins the game. George rolled his eyes. He stretched his long legs out in front of him. I don't know any scary stories. Besides, I think I might get some sleep soon. I'm pretty tired. Oh, come on. Just one each. You must know at least one scary story. Everyone does. Plus, I know loads of good ones. I watched George's face for a reaction. Unless you're one of those kids that's frightened easily, that is. Then I guess you might not like the game. It was a risk. But George bit. I'm not scared of anything. The skin below his blonde hair creased into a frown. I've watched horror films with my big brother that are that are rated 18. We even found one on, on YouTube that's banned and I still watched it. I didn't say anything. Just looked back at George and smiled. After a few seconds, he let out another sigh. Fine, let's play your stupid game then. But after you're done failing to scare me, that's it. I'm going to bed. George went first. His story wasn't bad, in fairness. It was one that he said his uncle told him a couple of years back. Nothing I hadn't heard before. Basically, there were two kids, and one of them gets hit by a car and dies. And after the funeral, the mother gives the surviving kids some money to go and get liver from the store, something to cook up for dinner. Because he's sick in the head, though, the kid pockets the money, digs up his brother, removes his liver instead. Then, later that night, the dead brother rises from his grave to come and get the kid in his sleep. A decent enough story, but I've heard it a hundred times already. I didn't let on, though. I met all the right faces, jumped to the right parts. George got quite into it. He gestured with his arms, and his watch glinted in the light from the bedside lamp. His blonde hair spilled across his forehead. He was so into the story, he didn't seem to notice. After it was over, he sat back, brushed the hair from his eyes, and grinned. Thought you were going to shit yourself at one point, he said. You might as well give up now, anyway. I'm not scared of anything. I looked across the room at him. The house was quiet now. Had been for a few hours. When we first come upstairs, there was still noise coming from below. The faint sound of the TV in the lounge, the rattle of plates being put away in the kitchen. Now there was only silence. Beyond the bedroom window, tree branches rustled in the wind. 
The occasional car passed by on the road outside. That was it. I grinned at George. So you're not scared of anything at all? No, nope. nothing. Not even stories that are true? George let out a bark of laughter. <laughs> nice try. Just hurry up and get it over with, will ya? I'm already bored. Okay. Fine. I shuffled forward on the carpet, so I sat closer to George. Our knees were almost touching. George frowned, but he didn't move. My story's about a family, I began. A family that looks normal enough on the outside, but isn't really normal at all. George rolled his eyes again. He was starting to annoy me quite a bit by now, but I didn't let on. I just carried on with the story as if I hadn't noticed. Well, this family moves around a lot. They never stay in one place for too long. They can't, you see. The family's good at disguising themselves. They're good at hiding their secrets. But they still can't go taking risks. If they stayed in one place for any more than a few weeks, they might get found out. Someone might discover what they really are. So what are they, then? I wanted to tell George not to interrupt, to just sit still and listen to the story. But I bit down the urge. Instead, I just grinned at him. The family are monsters, I said. They're all monsters. They travel from town to town. They leave a trail of dead kids wherever they go. I paused, expecting George to interrupt me again, but he didn't. He only stared back at me. There was no expression on his face as he twirled a lock of blonde hair around his finger. The family has a very specific way of doing things, I continued. When they move into a new area, they find a house that's been left unoccupied. Not a completely empty house, just one where the people that normally live there are off on holiday or something. One that'll be empty for a week or two. The family doesn't need long. See, a couple of weeks suits them just fine. So they break into the house. And then they go about setting the trap. It's their own kid they use. They send them off, make friends in the new neighborhood, around the nearby parks, maybe off to the local school under a fake name, tell them to get to know the other kids. The family is hungry by this point. Really badly hungry. But they don't do anything just yet. They've learned to be patient. I paused and took a breath. This was a story I'd told before, but I found I liked it more and more with each retelling. The trick was not to rush through. I had to savor it. I'd opened the bedroom window when we first came upstairs, and now a draft of cold air blew through. It ruffled the curtains behind George. Tree branches shook in the garden outside, the leaves whispering to each other. George watched me, not saying anything. I had his attention. The kids' parents don't have to wait long, I continued. They never do. They've trained the kid well, see, he's, he's not just a victim in all this. He may only be young, but he knows how the game works. Once the family has been in the area for a little while, a few days, maybe a week at most, the kid makes his choice. He picks a new friend to invite back to their house. The parents give him an incentive, too. He's still too young to share the tastes they have. They tell him that's something he'll only acquire when he gets older. But he still gets something out of it. What does he get out of it? George's eyes were fixed on mine. His finger kept twirling that same lock of hair over and over again. And he gets the other kid's stuff, I replied. Whoever he picks, he gets to keep all their belongings after his parents are finished with them. Somewhere in the house below us, a door slammed. George's eyes flicked away from mine towards the bedroom door, then back again. I smiled at him. So... George kept his eyes on me as he tried to formulate the question. So... So what exactly do the parents get? What do they do with the kids they take? Oh, they eat them, I replied. They eat their insides. They tear the kids open while they're still screaming. They pull out their guts and intestines by the handful, wolf everything down until there's nothing left but a husk. I grinned. 
Somewhere below us, a floorboard creaked. The sound was faint and muffled, and I didn't think George heard it. Can you imagine what someone looks like when they've had everything inside them removed? They hardly even look like a person at all. It's like the, the stuff a snake leaves behind when it sheds its skin. The glow from the bedside lamp made George's skin look pale. His lips were slightly parted as he stared at me. But how do they get away with it? He asked. Do the parents of the kid that get taken come looking for them the next day? When their kids don't show up back home? I grinned back at George. I've been hoping he'd ask. Well, the family's long gone by that point, I said. They vanish like shadows in the night. The only thing they take with them is the remains of the dead kid. And when the parents come looking for them the next day, all they find is a locked house that belongs to somebody else. Another floorboard creaked. It was louder this time. We both heard it. The sound had come from the corridor outside the bedroom. George's head swiveled in the direction of the door. His eyes were wide in his pale face. What was that? Oh, that was nothing. I lied. Probably just the house settling. Nothing to be scared of, George. I eyed the watch on his wrist. I imagine what it would look like on mine. From the corridor outside came the soft sound of approaching footsteps. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just want to make sure that all of you guys are still staying safe and doing your best to stay inside and keep yourself quarantined if you can do so. For those of you who can't, really appreciate you guys doing what you, you know, have to do. So, all the best to all of you who are still working, and all the best to all of you who are forced to kind of stay home and are not able to work. If you guys are missing out on a lot of the conventions, which at this point, all of them that I was planning on going to this year, with the exception of San Japan, uh, looks like have been either canceled or pushed back. If you guys were looking forward to any of the conventions this year and are missing out on a lot of the artwork from some of your favorite authors or artists, take a look in the description down below. At least until the quarantine is over, you'll be able to find links to a bunch of my artist friends as well as authors uh, in the description of every video. And of course, I will be bringing you guys stories every single day from now until the end of time, available here on YouTube as well as here on the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, and Google, and wherever else you can get podcasts. And now a very special thank you, big thank you, the biggest thank you I can possibly give to all of you who support on Patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, who help keep the lights on in my house. Patreons such as... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lendo Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, G Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Center, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Gabrielle Undefined, Barbie Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Dr. Strawberry, Barbara Masio, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, Let's Get Scared, S-Man, Brandy Hasanori, and King DDD. Thank you guys so much for supporting on Patreon, as well as all of you that are shown in the description down below. And sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>